Welcome to Stanford Legal, where we talk about the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Hi, Joe. Hi, Pam. Pam, our audience knows that when there's important Supreme Court decisions handed down, we're going to be there to explain them and analyze them. Ditto when there's changes on the court. And this year we had both of those things. We had some important decisions, although you really had to wait until June to see the big ones. I mean, I know that's kind of a cliche every year, we'll wait until June. But this year, the really biggest cases came down in June. And of course, the beginning of this Supreme Court term was also kind of extraordinary. Uh, there were only eight justices on the bench for the first week of the uh, oral arguments in October. Uh, and the court laid low for a while. So we're going to talk about this term at the Supreme Court, changes, uh, and what the court decided. And we're uh, really lucky today to have as our guest Brian Fletcher. Brian uh, spent five years at the Solicitor General's office, which is the office that argues cases on behalf of the United States government. It's the most frequent litigant in the Supreme Court. Uh, and then he's come to Stanford, where he's uh, at the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic with Jeff Fisher, who's been a repeat guest on the show and me, uh, litigating cases at the Supreme Court and teaching students. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thrilled to be at Stanford and happy to be here on Stanford Legal. <laughs> That's great. It's great to have you. And our other guest uh, uh, for this show, Pam, is you. Because as oh, our- do I get a second mug to <laughs> You absolutely do. You have a different status here, a kind of an exalted one, because as our audience knows, you've the co-head of our uh, Supreme Court clinic, and uh, like Brian, you've argued a number of Supreme Court cases. I think you're up to eight now. And uh, for those who aren't regular visitors, the average number dividing lawyers into Supreme Court cases is about 0. .00000 infinity. So uh, we're happy to have you as our second guest. Thanks so much. So, Brian, one of the things that Justice White was famous for saying is that every time mm -hmm. a new justice joins the court, it's a new court. So what made this new court different from other new courts? Well, I think it's it's sort of doubly a new court because Justice Gorsuch is still a relatively new justice. And then, of course, as you said, this term, we got Justice Kavanaugh added to the mix as well. And so I think that's really changed both brought two new personalities to the court and also with Justice Kavanaugh replacing Justice Kennedy, who's for a long time been the swing justice on the court. We've really seen the median of the court move in an interesting way as well. Yeah. And, and tell us a little bit about what you think the, the change, the swap out of Justice Kennedy for Justice Kavanaugh has meant for the court. Well, it's, I think it's meant uh, oftentimes with controversial, the sort of high profile cases, the ones that you'd be waiting for in June, very often those cases were pitched as what is Justice Kennedy going to do? And he was described as a swing justice. In that there were some cases where you really couldn't tell whether he was going to go one way or the other. But then there were some areas where he had just idiosyncratic commitments. He was, you know, on the, the left side was a very big proponent of gay rights and wrote a lot of the court's big gay rights decisions. And in other areas was actually quite conservative and very predictable in that way. But the things had sort of settled into a groove around the areas where you knew where Justice Kennedy was going to be or likely to be and the areas where his vote was in play. And a lot of the game in those close cases was pitching your case to Justice Kennedy. And now that's all been scrambled a little bit because Justice Kavanaugh, we're still learning about what he's like, but he's not going to be the median in every one of those cases. And so you see litigants trying to assemble a different majority by appealing to different members of the court rather than focusing quite so much on just one justice. And one of the things that struck me as particularly significant this year is, as you say, People had been pitching their cases to Justice Kennedy for a good long time, and it takes a while for cases mm -hmm. to make their way up to the Supreme Court. I mean, occasionally a case moves very fast, and we'll talk about one in, mm -hmm. a, in a moment that did. But one area of law where the cases had been going on for years was political gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. And last year at the Supreme Court, the court had two uh, political gerrymandering cases, and both of them kind of fizzled out. The court didn't actually reach the merits of does the Constitution – condemn political gerrymandering, and if it does, what are courts going mm -hmm. to do about it? And people have been litigating these cases for years. So another set of those cases arrived this year. And maybe tell our listeners a little bit about what happened. Yeah, this has really been a, a, a longstanding saga. For decades, the court has been looking at these cases and I think has been troubled by the practice of political gerrymandering, but has also been troubled by the idea of plunging the court into uh, those cases. And some justices, Justice Scalia wrote for four justices in a, in a case uh, called V versus Jubilee, saying the court just has no business here. But Justice Kennedy wouldn't go along with that. And it said, I, I, I don't see it yet, but I'm holding open the possibility that there's going to be some way 
way people will come up with some standard that the courts could use to adjudicate these claims. And everyone thought last year that those two cases that you mentioned were going to be his opportunity to say, yes, I've, I've found the way for I, I've accept this standard that the parties have brought me. And then, as you say, they fizzled. And so this year we, we got two more cases and those turned out quite differently without Justice Kennedy on the court. What happened? So the the court, the, these were two of the cases that came down on the very last day and an opinion written by the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, for a five to four majority, uh, he held that the court just can't decide these cases, that there's a lack of judicially manageable standards. Uh, and so the, these claims just aren't cognizable. So is that kind of the end of the saga here? That is, for a long time, people thought one case could be different than the other. Now, with unless a justice changes mm -hmm. his or her position, it's over. Is that right? Because the position is nothing matters. If, if it's a political question, there's nothing too extreme. Is that a fair statement? I mean, I, I would be curious to hear Pam's thoughts on this because she's the election law expert, but I I think it's hard to read any wiggle room into the Chief Justice's opinion. So as you say, unless the court decides at some future point to revisit what was said here, it sure seems like the door is shut, at least in the federal courts. One of the things that the court says and, and that's been happening is that there may be room to bring these claims in state courts under state constitutional provisions where they're not bound by the way that the Supreme Court interprets the federal constitution. But at least as far as the Chief Justice and the current majority are concerned, it seems like partisan Jeremy Mandarin claims are out of business at the Supreme Court. I mean, it's interesting. I think they're out of business as political gerrymandering claims. That is, you can't go to the Supreme Court or federal courts right now and say, this is unfair because it's too partisan. But there are other claims that you can bring to challenge a redistricting plan. I mean, one person, one vote is a famous example of that, where the districts all are supposed to be the same size. Or the Voting Rights Act, which says that you have to fairly represent minority communities. Or something called the Shaw Doctrine that the Supreme Court developed in the 1990s uh, that said you can take race into account to satisfy the Voting Rights Act, but you can't take into account too much. It's kind of like the Goldilocks rule of redistricting. And so what I think you're going to see is the two main political parties, the Republicans in states where the Democrats are in control and the Democrats in states where the Republicans are in control, they're going to try and turn what would have been a political gerrymandering claim into a one-person, mm -hmm. one-vote claim or into a Shaw claim or into a Voting Rights Act claim. And the problem here is that runs the risk of distorting those doctrines, which really aren't about partisan political fairness, because nobody's going to give up. The stakes are too high. They're just going to look for some other way of going after these gerrymanders. And so I think, you know, the the 20 after the 2020 census, an issue to which I want to turn in a moment, I think after the 2020 census, you're going to see a lot more cases they're just not going to be able to come in and say this is politically unfair. So this is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with Brian Fletcher about uh, the Supreme Court term. Joe? Well, let's turn to that other big case, which is the census case. And uh, uh, Brian, do you want to start off, or Pam, who... who Who's willing to educate our <laughs> readers on that case, our listeners, excuse well, me? Well, I can start and then Pam can correct me and fill in <laughs> when I screw up. Uh, so the, the census happens every year. It's a mandated by the Constitution, an actual enumeration of the population, and it's used, as we were just discussing, for drawing districts for federal and, and state elections and also for allocating federal funds. It has a lot of consequences. And uh, for, for many years, for several decades, the census form that's sent to every American household has not included a question about whether or not uh, the members of the household are U.S. citizens. And the reason for that is because the people in the census concluded some time ago and have stuck with that conclusion that if you ask that question, you're going to lead people who aren't citizens to be reluctant to answer the question and you're going to get worse data from the census. And this year or, or this cycle in 2018, the Secretary of Commerce, who has authority over the census, he oversees the Census Bureau and the government, decided that the, the for the 2020 census, the they were going to begin asking the citizenship question uh, once again. And that prompted a bunch of legal challenges, uh, two of which were consolidated and reached the Supreme Court, arguing that the decision to add that question was illegal on a number of different grounds. Yeah, and, and just something for all of our listeners, when you get your census form, fill it out and send it back um, because everybody needs to be counted as part of the census because, as Brian says, it's not just about political representation. It's also about federal funds because federal block grants mm -hmm. go to the states based on how many people are there. 
Um, and we've always counted people who weren't citizens in the census. I mean, back to the notorious three-fifths clause in the original Constitution, we counted slaves who were not citizens as part of the population. The only people who weren't counted were uh, Indians who were not taxed, um, which is not really a category anymore. Um, and so the uh, the government gave the rationale for putting this question uh, about citizenship on the census that it was necessary in order to enforce the Voting Rights Act, that the federal government enforces Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which requires districts be drawn fairly for African American, Latino, Asian American, and Alaska uh, Natives and Native American voters so that they have political power. Um, and the challenge that was brought, and I should uh, disclose here that I was an expert for the state of California and for a group of civil rights groups challenging the, uh, the question. Uh, they brought a challenge saying this isn't, this, you don't actually need this information on the census to get this question. And it will be damaging because, as Brian says, fewer people will answer uh, the question. So the, the government gives a rationale for doing something. And one of the things this case seems to raise is, does that rationale have to be right? Can we mm -hmm. measure it? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that, that ends up, to, to, to sort of cut to the bottom line, that ends up being the really critical point uh, in the court's opinion. The chief justice, again, writes the majority opinion, and he writes it for two different majorities. He's joined by the conservatives in rejecting a bunch of the challenges that the plaintiffs had brought to this decision. He says it doesn't violate the Constitution to include this question. It doesn't violate the relevant statutes. And the secretary could have rationally concluded that if you need to know how many citizens are in the country, you can ask the question on the census, even though some people disagree. But, he says, this Voting Rights Act business, once the court looked under the hood, wasn't the real reason why you included the question on the census. And administrative agencies have a basic obligation to give the real reason for their decisions. That didn't happen here. And so the decision has to be set aside. And how did we know what the real reason was? Or what was the real reason? Did the justice think or did either of you think? Well, the court doesn't say what the real reason is. They simply say this can't be the reason because it's just too jacked up. It's too made up. It came too late in the process. Uh, and, the, and, and one of the things that happened is usually when a case gets to the Supreme Court, there's just a record in the case. Um, but here, the record seemed to be constantly shifting because of a, a, another case that was brought in North Carolina where uh, they discovered a bunch of CD-ROMs and computer uh, stuff from a dead Republican political operative who said, no, the reason we're, we should put this on the form is it will help to advantage uh, Republicans and non-Hispanic whites, which is exactly the opposite. And I think the Supreme Court just couldn't blind itself to what they knew was going on out in the world, or at least five of the justices couldn't blind themselves to that. Um, I think it's pretty clear the reason this was put on the form is has nothing to do with enforcing the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and the Chief Justice, in his opinion, said, you know, you can't expect judges to ignore what everybody else knows. Um, this is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking about the Supreme Court term with Brian Fletcher. And Brian, one of the things that you sort of s slid into your answers to both of the questions that I think is important for our, our listeners to know is the Chief Justice wrote both of these important mm -hmm. opinions. And now with Justice Kennedy gone, on a lot of issues, mm -hmm. he's not just the Chief Justice, he's also the swing justice. Exactly. And that's something at least in modern American history, we haven't had. That's right. I, th I think for a long time, uh, the swing justice has been, it was Justice Kennedy. Before that, it was Justice O'Connor and Justice Powell. It's been a long time since the, the chief justice has also been the swing justice. And that, that really gives him a lot of influence because he both gets, he's often the deciding vote. And when he is in the majority, he gets to assign the opinion, which is how he ended up with the opinions in both of the cases that we talked about. You know, I'm reminded of... Uh, a doctrine in my primary field, tax, which is called the smile test or the straight face test, which is you can have a lot of rationales, but they got to pass the smile test because you got to be able to say it with a straight face. And it seems like the evidence that came out in this case suggested that here that test might have been failed. 
I think that's a really nice analogy. And I think the Chief Justice's opinion, it's really at great pains to say we are very deferential to these sorts of things. There can be multiple reasons why agencies make their decisions. They don't have to tell us all of them. It's okay if politics infects it a little bit. But what really bothered him here, as I think Pam alluded to, was the idea that there was just a lot of evidence that the one reason that the Secretary of Commerce gave in his memo announcing this decision, the Voting Rights Act, just wasn't the real reason. And, and that, I think, was just too much for him to swallow. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is generally once the Supreme Court has ruled, everybody falls into line behind it. I mean, I think about, for example, the marriage decisions after the Supreme Court decided marriage equality with the exception of one or two really retrograde county clerks in Kentucky and uh, Chief Justice Roy Moore in Alabama, everybody else fell into line and people got their marriage licenses. And here, one of the fascinating things that we're seeing is the government is not falling into line behind the Supreme Court and saying, OK, uh, you told us that uh, we didn't have a good rationale for this. We told you we needed to know by July 30th. You gave us your answer. We're walking away. The president tweeted, and now you have a whole new team of Justice Department attorneys coming in, apparently, to try and come up with another rationale for putting this question on the census. It's, it's really a remarkable situation. And I don't know, you know, the Chief Justice's opinion just doesn't say you can't ask this question, just says the reason you gave isn't good enough. And I don't know what he thought was going to happen as a result of that. I, people have debated whether or not he meant to leave the door open or not. I'm pretty sure that he did not envision what's happened so far, which has been flip-flops in positions and sort of changes in personnel in the Justice Department. It's really a remarkable process playing out. Yeah, and it's especially interesting because the Solicitor General's office told the court repeatedly, if we don't know what the rule is by July July 1st, we can't conduct the census. And now they seem to be backing off of that. So it's going to be very interesting. I think this is going to be a summer where we're likely to see some emergency motions going up to the court. And it's been a little while since since we've seen those. And, and I suppose that Justice Roberts, the Chief Justice, is now going to have to decide whether he'll accept – uh, a facial, what would otherwise be a facially valid decision in his uh, rationale. Presumably right, exactly. You know, I don't know exactly how this is going to play out, but I assume the Department of Commerce is going to announce we've come up with a new rationale. Here's what it is, and that'll be challenged through the lower courts, and it'll land in the Supreme Court, and there'll both be questions about what do you do with this rationale on its face? Does it stand up on its face? What do you do about the fact that it wasn't the original rationale? Is it somehow tainted because of the contrived explanation that the court found that the government gave in the first place? And then, as Pam said, there'll be this question about timing, too, and what do you make of the fact that the government said that it'd be all but impossible absent extraordinary efforts or additional resources to print the forms if they weren't finalized by July 1st. I think all of that will be in play in the litigation that we're likely to see over the summer. And I wonder to what extent also this the, the, the Chief Justice's opinion here was affected by last year with the travel ban. I mean, at least with the travel ban case, the government had to try several times. But by the time the case got to the Supreme Court, kind of well-qualified lawyers had cleaned up the travel ban, so it wasn't quite so obviously just a Muslim ban. Whereas here, because the government raced so fast to get the case to the court, uh, it hadn't cleaned up its rationale. Well, we'll be back with more from Brian Fletcher talking about the Supreme Court and the uh, October term 2018 uh, after this break here on Stanford Legal on Sirius XM Insight 121. Welcome back to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Joe? Uh, Pam, and um, uh, I'm going to ask you a question about the new court here now, which is, uh, did we get a lot of overturning? I mean, you got a new judge there, and of course, Brian, you're in on this question too. Did we expect things to to happen differently that did or didn't? So, Brian, I mean, I think the answer is uh, we we got some overruling, but maybe not as much as people thought. Uh, the court, in a number of cases, I can think of at least three or four this term, granted uh, cert, agreed to hear a case uh, where the question presented was, should we overturn some precedent of ours? And that's a pretty unusual thing. And when the court does that, there's usually a, that's usually a pretty good sign that at least some members of the court are really interested in overruling a precedent. And uh, at the at the end of the year, the court did in fact overturn a couple of longstanding precedents, and then. 
then declined to overturn some longstanding precedents over some pretty heated dissents in a couple of other cases. So it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, and I suspect that's what we'll continue to see going forward. Yeah, I mean, one of the cases that our listeners might find most interesting where the court took the case solely for the question of are we going to overrule was a case about the double jeopardy clause and something called the separate sovereigns exception to double jeopardy, which is um, something that a lot of our listeners may be following quite a bunch right now. And that is uh, the double jeopardy clause says the government can't try you twice for the same thing. But how we define the government is each state is a separate government and the federal government's a separate government. So you can be tried by both the federal government and by the state government for doing exactly the same thing, and you can be sentenced twice. And if you're acquitted in federal court, you can still be tried in state court or vice versa. I mean, case that are, a lot of our listeners may remember is the Rodney King mm-hmm. uh, case, where he was acquitted. The, the people who attacked Rodney King were acquitted in state court and then were tried in federal court. And of course, there's been lots of concern about the separate sovereigns doctrine because of the question whether President Trump will pardon lots of people for various crimes that the states will then want to prosecute them for. So the Supreme Court took that case solely for the question of were they going to overturn a longstanding precedent uh, and ultimately decided not to pull the trigger on that. Um, Whereas they did pull the trigger on a case that involves how you deal with when the government takes property for a public use. And what was that case about? What, What compelled them to kind of overturn a precedent there? Well, different justices have different views on this. So I don't know if you want to say a little bit about kind of how justices think about what's called stare decisis, which is let the precedent stand unless you have a good reason to overturn them. Yeah, the justices do have different views on this. And the way that they think about this has been an interesting dynamic to watch play out at oral arguments and in the opinions. And actually, you know, Justice Thomas, in the case that Pam was talking about, the double jeopardy case, I think it was, issued an opinion where he said, I'm, I'm persuaded that we ought to stick with this dual sovereigns doctrine, because even though I had some questions about it, I'm persuaded that it's correct as a matter of the, the original understanding of the Constitution which is what's very important to him. But he said, I just want to take the opportunity to set out my views on stare decisis. And my view is that if a precedent, if we decide a precedent is demonstrably wrong, that's good enough and we ought to overrule it then. And that's that's on the more aggressive end of the spectrum. Other justices, not so much. Uh, and, and you saw that in the case that Pam mentioned about takings, the Nick case, uh, which requires people who think that a state or local government has taken their property in violation of the Fifth Amendment to go to state court uh, before they go to federal court and which had without getting into too many of the details, it basically made it impossible for you to bring a takings claim against a city in federal court. Because if you went to state court and lost, that prevented you from then taking another bite at the apple in federal court. And that was a situation that bothered a lot of people and a lot of the conservatives on that side of the court in particular. And they decided to revisit it and ultimately overruled it. And they did that over a a very uh, sort of impassioned for the subject matter, which is pretty technical, uh, dissent from Justice Kagan that was really all about the the virtue of stare decisis and the importance of adhering to precedent, which was a theme you saw from her and from Justice Breyer and the, the others on that half of the court. You know, I think some of us, when we hear a stare decisis or precedent, we might think of something like Roe v. Wade. And is that kind of in the background here for the court when they say it, or is that so far away that it doesn't affect cases like this. Can you read anything into this newer court on whether they're going to be more or less radical in getting rid of past precedent? It's hard to say, but one of the things we did see this year is the Supreme Court did have an abortion case that came up to it that involved a a prohibition under uh, Indiana law on uh, sex selection uh, abortions, that is having an abortion because of the sex of the fetus or because of a disability that the fetus had. The Supreme Court refused to hear that case. Um, And in refusing to hear it, they had a little tiny snippet of insight where they said, we don't take cases like this unless there's a conflict in the lower lower courts. So I think they're eager to avoid having to take the abortion case anytime soon if they can if they can avoid it. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking about the Supreme Court with Brian Fletcher. Joe? Uh, Brian, what do you think on this uh, answer about, is this court going to be a little bit more aggressive in overturning precedent? And 
in particular on Roe v. Wade, because I know that's one of the cases on a lot of our listeners' minds. Well, I think the the general answer is a little bit easier to give, which is I, I think one of the things that leads you to, to overturn precedent is if you think precedent is wrong, the precedent is wrongly decided, and then you have a question about how wrong does it have to be, or yeah. what else do you need yeah. to actually overturn it? And the situation that you have now, I think, is that with the, the changes in the court, there are a lot of precedents that a majority of the current court is at least very skeptical about. And so there are a lot more cases where that question is going to come up and you have to answer the question, are we so persuaded or are there other factors that make us want to actually pull the trigger and, and overrule the case? Uh, but that butts up against what I think is a consideration that's really important to a lot of justices, including the chief justice, and that's the, the public legitimacy of the court. And I think uh, the chief justice and, and other justices too are very mindful of that and realize that every time they overturn a precedent, that calls into question the idea that the justices are doing law and not politics. And, and so I think that's something that's tugging them in the other direction. Yeah. And, you know, one thing to keep in mind also is in addition to the high profile cases where the court splits 5-4 and most people think it's pretty predictable how they'll split, a lot of the Supreme Court's caseload on very important issues that touch millions of people in a variety of ways are statutory cases. They're not constitutional cases. And they there often are odd ways of building a coalition as a lawyer to get a winning uh, a winning decision here. And I just thought in the kind of last couple of minutes, we might talk about a couple of those cases because our clinic had three cases last year that involved statutes that we won, even though we tend to represent the kind of little guy who is often thought to be less likely to win in front of this court. And Brian, do you want to say a little bit about those cases? Sure. And, and I think I'll talk about each of the cases individually just very briefly. But I think the overarching theme to, to take out of them is that in each of those cases, the clinic had what I think is the more natural reading of the statute. And and the fact that the clinic won with those more natural readings, even though those favored the little guys, uh, which might be surprising to, to some people, is that uh, the court increasingly has become, in, in Justice Kagan's words, we're all textualists now. Uh, the, the, the justices for all of their differences, I think one thing that unites most, if not all of them, is that they need a pretty good reason to want to depart from the most natural reading of the statutory text, and they differ as to how good a reason needs to be and what reasons are good. Uh, but if you go into this court with a good textual argument on a matter of statutory interpretation, you're in pretty good shape. And fortunately, the clinic had those good arguments in, in the three cases that we took up this term. Yeah, and the interesting thing about, about two of those cases is our clients actually had won in the lower court. Uh, and the reason there was a disagreement in the lower mm -hmm. courts was because there were cases from decades ago that didn't read the text of the statute. And so uh, the court took those cases, but it held, you know, read the words of the statute. And that's uh, something worth kind of understanding, I think, for, for our listeners, that there are a lot of cases that are in that posture where a progressive statute will be interpreted progressively, even by a conservative court. And one of those, too, was about the coverage of the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and whether it reaches all state and local governments, regardless of how small the particular agency might be. And the court said, yes, it, it does. And the other one was about uh, whether a plaintiff's failure to satisfy all of the administrative prerequisites to bring a suit under Title VII, which prevents racial discrimination in employment, uh, deprives the courts of jurisdiction to hear her claim. And the court said, no, it doesn't, because the statute doesn't say it does. Yeah. Well, there's so much here. Uh, if we just looked at our clinic and the cases that we get to argue for the Supreme Court, which, again, I want to remind our listeners is totally unique. To, to think that you're arguing three cases in a term is really terrific. Uh, and we've argued more than that, I know. Yeah, I think we had six, six or seven merits cases this year in the clinic. And, and we've covered... Just those briefly, maybe we can come back to Brian and, and, and cover some of some of those in more detail. We've also looked at the big cases, the census case, the gerrymandering case, and finally, the new court, the elevation of now Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, what does it mean for future decisions? So thanks so much for joining us, Brian, and thanks to our listeners for joining us on Stanford Legal here on Sirius XM Insight 121.